Hi boys and girls, this is lecture 2.9 in unit 2, the last of the unit 2 lectures. The topic, basic differentiation rules and rates of change. Notice on this slide I have a little subtitle, basic differentiation rules aka shortcuts and rates of change. As fond as all of you were of the limit definition of the derivative, you may have wondered at times if there were a quicker, easier way to take the derivative rather than using the limit definition of the derivative every single time. Well, this is the lecture where you learn the shortcuts for taking the derivative, starting with the constant rule. The derivative of a constant is zero just that simple. That is, if c is a real number, then the derivative with respect to x of c is 0. Here are some examples. If the function f of x equals 0, f prime of x equals 0. If f of x equals 7, f prime of x equals 0. If f of x equals negative 3, f prime of x equals 0. Of course, the common theme here is that each of these functions are constant functions, and the constant rule says the derivative of a constant is always 0. Next, we have the power rule. It's the most important rule for taking derivatives that we will see, so I'm going to put a little star by it. The power rule says that if n is a rational number, then the function f of x equals x to the n is differentiable, and the derivative with respect to x of x to the n is n x to the n minus 1. Notice that the exponent came around to become the coefficient of the derivative function, and the new exponent is 1 less than the original. Now let's put this power rule into practice. We're going to take the derivative of these three functions, but before we begin, let's fondly remember the process required to take the derivative using the limit definition of the derivative. Remember, we would need to state what f of x plus delta x is. We would need to set up the difference quotient. We would begin a mighty algebraic labor of love in order to simplify and produce the result. It's not a bad thing, perhaps, that we'll find a simpler way to take the derivative using the power rule. Let's get started. The key to being successful in using the power rule is to rewrite your functions in such a way that you are able to use the power rule. You would want a variable to an exponent. So for this first function, we don't really need to rewrite it because it's already written in terms of a variable to an exponent. We can go ahead and take the derivative. f prime of x here is going to be 3x squared. We take the exponent, it comes around to become the coefficient, the new exponent will be 1 less than the original, and that's your derivative. This would be the same result you would get if you had chosen to use the limit definition of the derivative, but much quicker, and of course, because of that, a valuable tool in taking derivatives. Now let's go to the next function. We are going to rewrite this function so that we have a variable to an exponent. g of x is equal to x to the one-third power. Remember that when you have a radical function, you can rewrite it so it has a rational exponent. The index of the radical is the denominator of the fraction, and the exponent of the variable is the numerator. Now that it's a variable to an exponent, we can use the power rule. g prime of x will be one-third x to the negative two-thirds. Again, the exponent comes around to become the coefficient, and then you have to subtract 1 from the original exponent. 1 third minus 1 is negative 2 thirds. Now let's simplify this answer. Since we have a negative exponent, it really indicates that this quantity should be in the denominator of the fraction. So g prime of x is equal to 1 over the 3 drops to the denominator and the cubed root of x squared drops to the denominator. In our third and final function here, we are able to rewrite it as x to the negative 2. Now that it is written as a variable to an exponent, we can use the power rule. 
y prime then is negative 2 x to the negative 3. Again, exponent becomes coefficient. Subtract 1 from the original exponent to get negative 3. Since this negative exponent is here, let's simplify this result, moving that quantity to the denominator of the fraction, negative 2 over x cubed. In this example, we're going to find an equation of the tangent line to the graph of f of x equals x squared when x equals negative 2. Whenever we write an equation of a line, we need two things. We need a point, an ordered pair, and we need a slope. We're going to easily be able to get the point. We have the x value and we have the function, so let's determine what the y value is when x is negative 2 by using the function. f of negative 2 is going to be negative 2 quantity squared, which is 4. Therefore, the ordered pair is negative 2 comma 4. Of course, we also need a slope and we'll be able to use the derivative of the function to get the slope. f prime of x is going to be 2x. The exponent comes around to become the coefficient. Subtracting 1 from the original exponent gives us a 1. This function, of course, will tell us the slope of a tangent line at any point along this curve. But we're only interested in this point. So what is the slope at the point negative 2 comma 4? f prime of negative 2 is going to be 2 times negative 2, which is negative 4. That is the slope. We'll take the slope and the ordered pair and write an equation of the line using point slope form. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. y minus 4 is equal to our slope negative 4. x minus a negative 2 becomes x plus 2. Now technically this is an equation of a line, but if you want the equation in slope intercept form, two short quick steps will get you there. Distribute the slope, you have negative 4x minus 8, and then add 4 over y equals negative 4x minus 4. And that is the equation of the tangent line at the point negative 2, 4 on the graph of f of x equals x squared. Let's expand our understanding of the power rule by looking at the constant multiple rule and sum and difference rules. If f is a differentiable function and c is a real number, then cf is also differentiable. And the derivative with respect to x of c f of x is equal to c f prime of x. This is just saying if you have a constant multiplied by a function, the derivative will be the constant multiplied by the derivative of the function. The sum or difference of two differentiable functions f and g is itself differentiable. Moreover, the derivative of f plus g or f minus g is the sum or difference of the derivatives of f and g. The derivative with respect to x of f of x plus g of x will be f prime of x plus g prime of x. The derivative with respect to x of f of x minus g of x will equal f prime of x minus g prime of x. It's going to be just as simple as taking the derivative of each function and adding them or subtracting them. Let's practice. Remember when possible to rewrite the function so that you would be able to use the power rule. So for this first function, I'm going to rewrite this as y equals 2x to the negative 1. The derivative then will be y prime equals, as I bring this exponent around, it will be multiplied by the current coefficient, giving me negative 2 x to the, subtract 1 from negative 1, negative 2. Since I have a negative exponent in my answer, let's rewrite this and simplify. y prime is equal to negative 2 over x squared. In this next example, I'm going to take this 4 and 5 and simply make it the coefficient of the variable. f of t equals 4 fifths 
t squared. Now it'll be a little simpler to see how to use the power rule. This exponent comes around to get multiplied by the coefficient, and of course we'll be subtracting one from the exponent. So f prime of t will be 2 times 4 fifths, which is 8 fifths. Subtracting 1 from 2 just leaves 1, so t to the 1 power. No simplification necessary for that derivative. Let's rewrite this function y equals 2x to the 1 half. Using the power rule, y prime equals 1 half times 2 is 1, and then x to the 1 half minus 1, x to the negative 1 half. With a negative exponent, we do want to simplify. That means we're going to have 1 over x to the 1 half power. For this next function, I can definitely simplify, uh, rewrite that first term, so I'm going to do so, even though I might run out of room. y is equal to take the coefficient, this fraction, and make it the coefficient of the variable 1 half, and then this quantity can be rewritten as x to the negative 2 thirds minus 4x plus 5. Now before I take the derivative, I want to remind you that the derivative of a constant, which we have here in 5, is going to be 0. Furthermore, when you have a coefficient times the variable x to the 1 power, the derivative will be simply the coefficient. Why? If the current exponent is 1, it's going to be multiplied by that coefficient. Then subtracting 1 from 1 gives you 0 anything to the 0 power is 1. So the short way of thinking about it is if you have negative 4x, the derivative of this term will be negative 4. So the total derivative, y prime equals negative 2 thirds times 1 half is negative 1 third x to the negative 5 thirds. Subtracting 1 from negative 2 thirds gives me negative 5 thirds and then minus 4 because the derivative of negative 4x is negative 4, and then that's it, because the derivative of 5 is 0. Let's rewrite this a bit. y prime is equal to negative 1 over 3, and then we're going to have the cubed root of x to the fifth minus 4. In our final example, we do have the opportunity to rewrite a bit. We'll have g of x is equal to negative one-half x to the fourth plus three x cubed and then we'll write this last term as minus three halves x to the negative one and I will pretend like that was taking place before we got to the column where the derivative happens so now we have g prime of x is equal to four times negative one-half is negative two x cubed because we subtract 1 from that exponent. The derivative of this second term will be 3 times 3, a positive 9x squared since we subtract 1 from that exponent. And then negative 1 times negative 3 halves gives us a positive 3 halves and then x to the negative 2 since you had to subtract 1 from negative 1. To rewrite this a bit we have g prime of x is equal to negative 2x cubed plus 9x squared and then plus 3 over 2x squared. We are also able to take derivatives of trigonometric functions starting with sine and cosine. The derivative with respect to x of sine x is cosine x. The derivative with respect to x of cosine x is negative sine x. These definitions should be memorized as soon as possible in order to make your life oh so much easier. Let's take the derivative of y equals 2 sine x. y prime will be 2 cosine x since the derivative of sine is cosine. I think we should rewrite this function first as y equals 1 half sine x and then take the derivative. y prime will be 1 half times the derivative of sine which is cosine x. In this last function when we take the derivative we'll first take the derivative of x which is 1, merely the coefficient of that function and you have 1 
then the derivative of cosine is negative sine minus sine of x. In this example, we're going to see an application of the derivative. The position of a free-falling object neglecting air resistance under the influence of gravity can be represented by the equation s of t is equal to 1 half g t squared plus v sub 0 t plus s sub 0, where s sub 0 is the initial height of the object, v sub 0 is the initial velocity of the object, and g is the acceleration due to gravity. On Earth, the value of g is approximately negative 32 feet per second squared, or negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It turns out that the velocity function is the derivative of the position function. So with this information, let's solve this problem. The position of the diver is given by s of t equals negative 16t squared plus 16t plus 32. This is the position function of the diver, and it models the height of the diver as he or she jumps off of a diving board. Given what we just read, let's decode this position function. Negative 16 comes from the acceleration due to gravity. Remember this coefficient, g, is multiplied by 1 half. So the negative 16 comes from 1 half being multiplied by negative 32. The 16, the coefficient of the t term, is the initial velocity. So this diver begins with an initial velocity of 16 feet per second. And the constant is s sub 0, the initial position. So this diver is starting at a height of 32 feet. Let's look at a little picture of what is happening with our diver. He or she is about to dive from a perilous height of 32 feet. The first question says when does the diver hit the water? He or she dives and notice since the diver is starting at 32 feet that when the diver hits the water the diver will be at a position 0. So essentially we're asking the position function when will the position be 0? That's the equation that we set up. 0 is equal to negative 16t squared plus 16t plus 32. We're asking the position function to give us the time at which the position was 0. This equation will be a lot easier to solve if we divide every term by negative 16. This gives us 0 equals t squared minus t minus 2. Fortunately, this quadratic factors into t minus 2, t plus 1, giving us two potential times. t minus 2 equals 0 gives us t equals 2 seconds, and t plus 1 equals 0 gives us t equals negative 1 seconds. I think it's safe to rule out this answer. At this point, at least, we are relatively certain that there is no negative time. Therefore, the diver hit the water two seconds after diving. This will help us to answer the second question. What is the diver's velocity at impact? If only we knew the velocity, because we know when he hit the water at two seconds. Fortunately, the derivative of the position function is the velocity. So velocity, which is the derivative of the position function, will be the exponent times the coefficient negative 32t, subtracting 1 from the exponent, plus 16, the coefficient of the t term. Of course, the derivative of 32 is 0. So here is your velocity function. We want to know what the velocity was at 2 seconds. So putting 2 into this function, negative 32 times 2 plus 16 gives us negative 64 plus 16, which tells us the diver's velocity after two seconds when he hit the water was negative 48 feet per second. That's the end of this lecture, and this concludes the Unit 2 lectures. God bless you, boys and girls.